We Europeans have invented a lot of things. Waffles, railroads, ferris wheels, postal codes, the sonnet. Hot water bottles were actually invented by the Croatians, not the English, even though the English are happy to claim hot water itself. Europeans are responsible for dry batteries, 1700,000 types of tulips, saunas, parliaments, and the cassette tape. Gas masks, and the reason why we need gas masks, lobotomies, cheese knives, cotton swabs, yacht clubs, vodka, the body mass index, and genocide. Now, we're not equally proud of all of these, but there's one thing we can all boast about, and without a doubt, and that's kindergartens. When the parents bring the child to us, to the teacher, they trust us. The Hungarian split system is not so bad. I'm so because happy to hear that something is actually good. Yes. <laughs> we have um, great examples and heartbreaking examples. Which, which one shall I give? <laughs> well, all of them. <laughs> the adults, they have forgotten that they were children. Adults do not remember how they have learned. So parents were like, wow, our opinions matter. We talk about feelings. This is interesting. I'm scared, but oh, there are cards. Let's see. I did literally cry on the shoulder of the nursery pedagogue of my kid when I was going through a hard time. And she was like really telling me like, it's an okay job that you're doing. I was like, really? That's a category? Yeah. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Standard Time. Today we're dissecting the world of early childhood education in Europe. I'm Reka Kinga Pop, a devoted kindergarten alumna and the editor-in-chief of Eurozine, the magazine bringing you this show. Eurozine is an online magazine connecting more than 100 cultural journals with an international audience. We are also the co-founder of the Display Europe platform, where you can find content from all over Europe in many languages and from many different viewpoints. Daycare, crèche, nursery, kindergartens, among a myriad of forms and institutions, early childhood education can be a heaven on earth when it works well, or a hellscape when it dysfunctions. The landscape varies widely across Europe, from the school superpower Finland to arch-capitalist Britain, from the world of free school meals and beeswax crayons to the privatization of family policy. A few factors are constant across the spectrum, though, Early childhood education is an absolute necessity for most families and it defines the entire academic career of the kid who gets to enjoy it. What we recognize today as nurseries and kindergartens originate from early 19th century experiments. One of them would be Robert Owen's Infant School in Scotland, which opened in 1816. That is, Brunswick championed angel gardens in Hungary starting in 1828. Friedrich Fröbel is responsible for the term kindergarten itself because his gardens for children started out in today's Germany in 1840. The idea soon crossed the oceans. The first public school kindergarten opened in 1870 in St. Louis, USA, but by the 1880s there were over 400 kindergartens in 30 US states. See? What works, works. Today this professional field serves a complex function, integrating children of varying abilities and backgrounds. They are experimenting with methodologies, they enable working families to even exist. These institutions develop skills and screen for difficulties, including a bunch of disabilities. They socialize and support children's personal development, foster intellectual and emotional growth, and produce literal tons of macaroni art. They integrate minorities and refugees, teach language and manners, and once a year, on Mother's Day, they make me ugly cry. However, it's not all rainbows and unicorns in the early education realm. Across Europe, many countries have been continually reducing their spending on education since the 1990s. This puts increasing strain on the professionals. From the family's perspective, the cost of childcare can be a significant burden. In some European countries, like Germany or Austria, the offer is relatively good due to the state support and freely available kindergartens in big cities. Whereas in the UK, families might spend up to 65% of their paycheck only to cover the cost of childcare, which is a crucial condition for them to even be able to earn a living. All that is to say, 
early childhood education plays a tremendous part in supporting families and children's development. They are a cornerstone of society and in many places across the continent, they need more support than they currently have. Today we have remarkable guests to delve into the topic. Victoria Such is the president of the Democratic Trade Union of Kreche employees in Hungary. She's a loyal advocate for enhancing the professional landscape for pedagogues, ensuring that they have the resources and the support to nurture our kids. Maria Roth is the director of the Montessori Adult Education Center in München, who also trains kindergarten teachers. Last but definitely not least, we have Flora Bocho from Partners Hungary, who's invested in the integration of Roma pupils into education systems. Each of our guests has a different take on childcare in Europe, and we're excited to hear what they have to say. Stick around as we dive into the world of early education, looking at what works and how we can make things better for our kids. Very welcome. Thank you so much for joining us, ladies. Please let's collect a couple of aspects. What early childhood education does beyond the obvious warehousing of children, which sounds horrible, but there is actually like a function that in terms of government's thinking or institutions thinking about early childhood education, what are the responsibilities of these institutions? Early childhood is a very sensitive period of the children. And it's, it's very important uh, to the good quality of the child care centers. And uh, so the children get a lot of attention from, for example, from uh, the child care workers. And they get a kind of socialization and they learn how can uh, eat alone, for example, or how can take a clothes alone because it's a, it's a learning method that the child care institution help as, uh, can give a special help for the vulnerable families and uh, for the special needs children because uh, the early childhood education and care workers has a knowledge, a different knowledge. Inclusion was the first thing that came to my mind. Uh, so I would like to pick up on that. Ideally, should be a place where um, children can feel, children and their families, caregivers can feel included, um, regardless of their social status, their abilities, their gender, etc., um, cultural background, and also um, it should be um, a place where um, professionals are fit and are um, are equipped of screening for a typical developmental signs if there's any support needed. Um, and also um, ECC centers in paper should also function as um, you know, part of the child protection network. That basically means that the professionals in these institutions pick up on the signs of a child, for instance, being abused or get or, or going. neglected. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Maria, in the Montessori method, which you are an expert of, the child is, and, and its development and, and its stages of development are always in the center. To see the child, to observe the child. But what can we see? We can see the movement, and then there is a development in moving, in speaking. And we, what is very important, that we give the child freedom, that they can exercise. And we should not always or not so many times interrupt the child because the child needs needs time, possibilities to exercise. And we know the child adapt to his environment. Some children need more time to develop. Some children are slowly. Some children need more help. So we have to adapt to the ability, to the natural ability of a child. And many People do not know the sensitive periods and so on. So Montessori gave us the idea that nature has given a lot of gifts to the child that the child can develop. But we have to assist the child. And not always the child has to do what I think, what I expect. This is the biggest problem. Hey there. Let me just flag you up someone who is a personal favorite of mine, easily the favorite podcaster of mine in the whole wide world. She's a colleague and a partner, Claire Potter. 
a professor emeritus of history from the New School for Social Research in New York. She was the co-founder of Public Seminar, one of our partners um, in the Eurozine Network, and her Substack called Political Junkie and her podcast called Why Now are fantastic. So if you like these kinds of in-depth and entertaining conversations, you're going to love everything that Claire does. Subscribe to her Substack, listen to her podcast, and just tell her that you love her because she deserves all good things in the world. Now back to the program. Let's talk about the, the differences across Europe, nation states and systems also, because across Europe we have very, very different setups. Some EU country has a split system or unitary system. A split system means there is a different institution and different uh, authorities and legislation for, from the different ages. It's usually the two part of uh, the age group. There's a first one to, to zero to, uh, from zero to three is a, a nursery or crash, and another uh, from uh, uh, three to six. Uh, this is a kindergarten age. For example, in Hungary we have a, si a split system. If I know well, in Germany we have a unitary system, and the the North countries, uh, for example, in Finland, and Norwegian, and Swedish, is a uh, unitary system as well. Those countries where has a unitary system, which ma is much more better than that con the, the service and the quality and the development of the children, or following the children development, it's much more better the unit in the unitary system. The split system has a big differences, but I, I think uh, the Hungarian split system is not so bad. I think it's a good one. I'm so because happy to hear that something is actually good. <laughs> yes, I agree. Because I see some other countries, it's more expensive and not uh, available for the for the all parents and not uh, the qualified workers and uh, so, so it has a lot of problem. And what do we know about what uh, early childhood education costs across Europe? Because that, to my poor knowledge, varies wildly. Like in yes. some places, yes. let's say including many post-socialist countries, you would have access to uh, nurseries, kindergartens, however you call them at some expense, but you wouldn't necessarily pay the kinds of fees as you do in the United Kingdom. Yes, it's an expensive in the UK. But for example, in Finland, it's a, it's a free one. And if I know in Germany, it has a mixed system because there is a free availability and another is the, the lot of parents uh, pay uh, the, uh, the childcare fee. So it's, um, it's a, it's a big differences between the countries, so it's, it's not, not an equal level. So we, we in the European Commission of the Childhood Education and Care Working Group, we try to, to, to find the balance between the countries and uh, we try to incentivize the countries to, to make uh, uh, good quality child care free for the parents everywhere. So I think it's a, it's a long distance work. When we talk about freely available early childhood education, there is a very strong class element that the children who need this, uh, this integration step also have to be able to, well, not afford it, but access it. So how do these systems actually work? How well do these European integration systems work? We have um, great examples and heartbreaking examples. Which, which one shall I give? <laughs> well, all of them. <laughs> For example, uh, a very personal experience, uh, the, the kindergarten where, where my son went uh, functions with um, a pedagogical program that's really designed uh, for life, meaning taking children as they are, in whole. And so um, it resulted in a very diverse group of children. Um, teachers made everybody feel welcome. Um, and also, um, we've heard examples of um, Roma parents where they remember when they went to kindergarten like 20 years ago or 30 years ago, 
kindergarten teachers um, consider them slow or not as intelligent as, um, as the majority uh, of the kids. Just because this kindergarten was their first place where they had to speak Hungarian. And if, uh, if the family conserved um, Roma traditions and spoke one of the Romani languages as the first language, children uh, worked very hard to translate what they wanted to say into Hungarian. And just this knowledge that this child is just slowly adapting to a language gap uh, was missing from some of the kindergarten teachers. This program is presented by Eurozine, an online magazine offering insightful reads from over 100 partner publications across numerous European languages. To support our work and enjoy exclusive benefits from as little as three euros a month, visit patreon.com slash Eurozine and become a supporter. Maria, you already mentioned that the Montessori method puts a huge emphasis on accommodating children's actual needs on an individual basis. You teach future pedagogues. What does this kind of training focus on? That Renil de Montessori said to me one time, it's not a pedagogic for this or this or this children. It's a pedagogic for each child. We can help each child. But sure. The adults, they have forgotten that they were children. Adults do not remember how they have learned, how they could learn. And so the adults make a program for the children, and the adults want that children get an education that we have later adults what we need for business companies and so. First, Montessori had children different age. Then she saw that children love to do different material. They do not ask, is this material for older or younger? They took material. And so she observed children need material for the hands. And then they can do something. They can discover. And so they learn mathematics by themselves with the material. But we adults do not understand this because we do not understand the nature, the natural gifts from the children. Each child has the right to learn. But not each child is able to learn today the same as the other 20 children because they have different interests. And so this idea that they have to learn the same each day, we have to break up. I think we have established that this professional work has very high stakes and can do really wonders. But these people are under a lot of pressure. So, Victoria, I would like you to tell us about the current situation that you experience and the things you think should be changed or adapted to improve the situation. So, the worker situation is not easy, especially in Hungary, I think. Both sector of the um, early childhood education and care, so it's true for the uh, crash workers and the kindergarten workers, but I think now the kindergarten workers situation is much more worse than the crash workers because of the legislation change and so on. So the workers under the pressure f f from the government, from the municipalities, from the parents. We as a trade union, we made a lot of work to ensure better life for the workers and for uh, the members. And we make a lot of researches. Childcare work, not only the mental work, there is a hard physical work lifting the children. For example, uh, childcare workers lifting uh, a day and more than 1,200 kilos. Everybody who has uh, cared for small children knows that it's hard physical labor, but it's 10 to 12 infants or toddlers yes. for, yeah. for the pedagogues at the creche. So that's, a, that's, as you calculated, the weight of a small car every day, which is yeah. quite significant. Is there a, a good solution, an, an example for a good solution that you can mention that can immediately um, alleviate this, this immediately is, I think it's never okay. no immediately solution yeah but I'm a consumer <laughs> so, so I want things yes. fast yeah so we have some initiatives to modify the uh, crash institution uh, building requirement uh, for example in the bathroom uh, and in the children group uh, to uh, to ensure the ergonomical um, 
safety for the workers and it will be successful so the new standard will be published uh, beginning of November so uh, I hope the new crashes what will be built in the future it will be more ergonomical friendly for example which is an important step uh, for the workers we as a trade union try to to base the training course for the workers especially uh, to learn that how can they move and uh, lifting the children, how can they save their uh, body and which is the good position to prevent uh, the musculoskeletal disorders. Originally, 10 years ago, we wanted to early retirement for the childcare workers, but the Hungarian government cancelled this possibility. The retirement age will be higher and higher year by year in the European level. I think it's a problem everywhere in the Europe, but nobody recognizes it and nobody speaks about it because uh, the parents just think about the nannies in the uh, childcare uh, institution only playing with the children and it's a very nice job, but it's a very ha hard job. And this is why it would be very important to have you know, opportunities to um, connect children and uh, educators. This is, for example, where, where uh, we usually teach restorative approaches um, to educators, like how can, we ha how can we create a structure where dialogue is possible instead of just a one-way communication? Because this is what really fosters you know, partnership and empathy, understanding each other's viewpoints. And you specifically facilitate these restorative discussions and you are a mediator. Can you tell us about a couple of examples? We are just finishing a three-year European project where we introduced um, collaborative pedagogical reflective methods in kindergartens um, and schools in four countries. The power of that was that um, teachers or educators could decide what method suits their reflection best. We were considering the perspectives of the involved people. How might the parents see or feel the, um, about the situation? What do they think? Just starting with checking circles, um, choose an image card that suits your feeling about, for example, your child entering kindergarten. Um, and um, so parents were like, wow, our opinions matter. We talk about feelings. This is interesting. I'm scared, but oh, there are cards. Let's see. Cards were the mediators of the feelings and thoughts. And um, so uh, what parents um, reported is that they were relieved that they, they could talk about how scary it was for them um, that their child is starting a new stage of life, um, how they were unsure how this will work out. Um, some of them were tearful that the, the, the teacher was interested and the teacher started to share own stories, which was like, finally, because this is something that happens really um, rarely, because teachers are expected to be professionals, leave feelings behind, but we are human, who, human beings working with human beings. And when the teacher shared their experience about own parental experience where, when, when their children entered kindergarten, um, parents felt such a connection to, to that person. Yeah, it really humanizes the yes. pedagogue because the pedagogue traditionally is conceived, you know, this like two, three hundred years old, three thousand years old notion of the authority. Yeah who towers above you. Whereas, especially around these small children, although I would argue also for way older people too, this is a personal connection. So in order to be able to develop and learn and, and really find your place, um, I, I would probably think that these personal connections are very important. Yeah, some of the teachers used to complain that um Nobody um, reflects on the information that they give. And when uh, they realized they could reduce the information to one pager, uh, bring the papers to the, the teacher-parent meetings, leave three to five minutes for the parents to read it, have a Q&A session, and then a discussion, and then playing games, and then coming out with the little cards. That's when um, the connection started and uh, better cooperations began uh, between teachers and parents. I got a bit emotional because I was reminded, I'm probably the luckiest person ever to have had these experiences, but I did literally cry on the shoulder of the, kinder, uh, of the nursery pedagogue of my kid when I was going through a hard time and she was like really telling me like, 
it's an okay job that you're doing. It was like, really? That's a category? Yeah. Uh, but I have to be mindful that not everybody has such a great experience. And we have already mentioned some of these cases. When somebody comes with a specific difficulty or a different background to the majority of the children, there are very individual needs, as Maria has mentioned, but there are also structural ones. So I would like to go back for a minute to Victoria now, uh, because I know that you have contributed to an integration plan for refugee children in early childhood education, a very pressing issue right now in Europe. A lot of Ukrainian refugees going uh, everywhere in the EU and with uh, small children, and it was a problem what can solve them. And we, we try uh, to collect, the, firstly, the information uh, about uh, to, to make a m kind of map uh, the reaction of the countries. And we saw that it's not, not a reaction is not equal. And the European Commission, Early Childhood Education and Care Working Group, uh, wanted to help and try to help to the member states. And we collect the good practices from the different countries uh, to uh, get an inclusive early childhood education and care for these uh, children. And refugee but children come from all over the place yes. right now. In yes, Europe it's as true. Well. And it was a huge problem, for example, in Germany, because in Hungary, only a transit country, but a <laughs> lot of. Uh, uh, migrants went or refugees went, went to in Germany. The biggest problem, the language barrier usually, uh, because we compare uh, the education level of, the, for example, the Ukrainian early childhood education uh, care workers, and we saw that it's, it's absolutely the same than, for example, in Hungary. So uh, those kind of women who is, uh, went abroad from Ukraine, they has a possibility to work and uh, the member states can adopt their graduation. I mentioned only the Ukrainian, it, this was the reason because we have a special focus for this uh, problem and the group. I just want to add that I will be very interested to see how these professionals working not just with Ukrainian children across Europe, but introducing themselves as uh, people of a refugee status and a different cultural background, how that will affect the children that they care for who don't necessarily share this. I would think initially that for my kid in a kindergarten to have an experience with someone speaking another mother tongue, that would be a very enriching experience. But then it comes to this very contentious and very bitter question, do you see an opportunity for some kind of positive effect of this push for integrating refugee children for the integration of minorities? This is what we are striving for. So when Ukrainian war started, uh, we also saw a change in donor policy focusing on uh, refugees, supporting refugees. When we approached donors or they approached us, uh, we always stated that we would like to support um, disadvantaged groups. And this may mean refugees coming from the Ukraine or from elsewhere in the world and disadvantaged population who are mostly, we are m working mostly with Roma communities. And um, it took some time um, for, for donors to, to pick up on that. Now we have a huge program running called um, Child is First, Elsio and um, and And we are supporting communities where there are refugee families and where there are um, um, disadvantaged Roma families and communities. And there's bringing a huge them overlap, together. let's be honest. Well, there, there, there is some overlap, yeah, absolutely. Although, of course, in the rates of mobility and who can actually leave a country, there are big differences. But when we are talking about, um, about refugees and people affected by yeah. active warfare and Roma communities, there is a huge overlap there. And now, a word from our partners. We owe a big thank you to the Library of the Central European University in Budapest, Hungary, for hosting our show today. The CEU Library boasts the region's largest collection of English language materials in the field of social sciences and the humanities. At both campuses in Vienna and Budapest, it's a welcoming place for all learners. In Vienna, their campus houses around 40,000 books and various study posts. 
Beside books, they also offer media creation, copying and scanning facilities. And in Budapest, a massive collection of about 135,000 books awaits you. I would like to come back to Maria. How would you like to work together with the parents on a positive relationship when it comes to um, when it comes to any kind of hardship? What is your ideal for a relationship with the parents? Okay, the very very first is we have to have in mind when the parents bring the child to us to the teacher, they trust us, and the parents need help. So that means I never can say uh, some bits about the child. It would hurt the parents. Can we find good things? And then when we talk about the good things, I like to talk to the parents every day when they pick up the child. We can say a few nice words. Your child was very happy today with, with writing the letters. Or I can also say, hmm, today we had a hard day to write letters. Today your child did not have fun with writing letters. I do not know why. And what is important for me that in the beginning we have the parent evening and we come together and we show the parents what we do so that they can understand the child. And then the, sure, they always can come, they can talk to us. And they also can say, my child has said something I do not understand. But we never criticize parents because they want to do the best and they want help from us. If you can have just one wish that comes true tomorrow, as of tomorrow, to implement something in early childhood education, any kind of change that you would want to see, that you would think is positive, what would that one wish be? Maria. Each child want to write when the child is four and a half. Three and a half to four and a half. This is the natural wish of the child. And what do the adults say? It comes later when you go to school. Later when the child comes to school with five or six or seven is not interested in writing because the time to have the wish to write is totally over. Then the child has the wish to read. I come to school, I'm big, I want to read. But how can I read when I do not have the letters? And so we miss one big wish to write and we cannot fulfill the next big wish because I did not get the letters early enough. We never can say, this comes later. When the child wants to know something, help the child that the child can learn it. So one thing you can change as of tomorrow, what would that be for you, Flora? Recognition, professional autonomy and support tailored to educators' needs. Okay, there's three things, yeah. but I very much respect how you, like, you know, put your foot through the door. <laughs> Victoria, what would your one single wish to be? And there's, okay, let's acknowledge we need many things, yeah. but let's, let's just name one thing that you would be so happy to have as of tomorrow. Mm. Free, available, good quality childcare places for all children in Europe. I can get on board with that. Thank you, ladies. This has been a truly enjoyable conversation. This program is presented by Eurozine, your portal for insightful reads from over a hundred partner publications across numerous European languages. To support our work and enjoy exclusive benefits from as little as three euros a month, visit patreon.com slash Eurozine. This talk show is a Display Europe production, a new content sharing platform that respects your user data. The venue for this episode is kindly provided by the library of the Central European University. This program is co-founded by the European Cultural Foundation and the Creative Europe program of the European Union. Please note that the views expressed here are solely those of the authors and speakers and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the European Union or the European Education and Cultural Executive Agency. Although I think they should take advice from us. Mm -hmm.